Welcome, Faith Church. Hey, good to see everybody. You look good today. We want to welcome our online campus. Thank you so much for tuning in today and those who are in the upper room because we're out of room down here. Thank you for watching as well today. So good to have you. You guys look good. I, have you enjoyed the study in Galatians? I think it's been incredible. I love that book, and we're on our last message today. We're starting Galatians chapter 6 this morning. Just so good to have every one of you here. Next month is Kingdom Builders Month. It's an exciting time for faith. We set vision, direction. We look at what God has done. We celebrate together. Uh, the first week is Love Our City. And we are involved in orphan care. Part of what we're doing is feeding the community at Thanksgiving. We'll be sharing highlights from all the campuses and bring in. We have a special guest next week you will not want to miss, Aaron Holt. He'll be bringing the word of God to you. It'll be phenomenal. And then the, the following weeks, Love Our World. We'll be talking about reaching unreached peoples and our mission around the world and what God has called us to do. And then the third week and last week is Love Our Church. So this is who we are. This is what we're here to do. This is why God has raised up Faith Church. And so we want you to be a part and know what is going on and what God is doing. Stand with me, turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we will get right into the Word of God this morning. I am excited, I'm ready, and I uh, hope you are too. Uh, Galatians 6 verse 7, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction, Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let us pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your word today. Your word is truth. I need your help. I need that anointing of the Holy Spirit of God once again today. We thank you for your sweet presence that is already here, Lord Jesus. And we just pray you'll open up our hearts to receive what you have for us. I thank you, God, and to you always belongs all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name, amen. Turn to someone, tell them they look awesome today, and then you may be seated. The evangelist Billy Graham was asked this question. He was asked, are young people are presently engaged in many activities that are currently not Christian? Don't you think it's natural for them to go through a period of sowing their wild oats? When they get older, they'll settle down, be good citizens, and please God. And Billy thought for just a moment and said, sowing wild oats, the Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. There's, there's God's law. It's God's immutable law. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Uh, at the time, the Apostle Paul, he's writing the Galatian church. They're in Asia Minor up in the area we now know as Turkey. There are some churches up there. There are believers up there. But they come from a Roman Greek background, a Greco-Roman background. And much of their philosophy was based in a man by the name of Epicurus. He's kind of set the whole mentality for the group, Greek mindset and the Greek culture. And he said this, and Paul would quote him in the book of Corinthians, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That, that doesn't sound very happy and exciting. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Now, the American philosophy is based on this Western civilization started by the Roman Empire, and so we kind of have in America somewhat the same mentality today, and it goes more like this. Do whatever feels good to you. Do whatever is right to you. Don't worry about the consequences. Live for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. And so we have this, this real party atmosphere spirit that permeates America today. And he says in verse number seven, he says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Let me just share a couple of ways I think that we can mock God. First of all, I, I believe we can mock God by thinking that somehow I can do what I want to and there are no consequences for my actions. Be not deceived, God cannot be mocked. We have this idea that there's this mush God of love that somehow because God is love that everybody's gonna make it to heaven, right? And you've been to every funeral service that you've ever been to and somehow we always, no matter how they live their life the entire time, we preach them right into heaven and so I wanna say nice things and good things. And, this, and there's a theological term for that, it's called universalism. Universalism says that somehow at the end of all the ages, everybody comes to heaven, everybody gets saved, everybody makes it, but we ignore all what the word of God says when it says God is holy. 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And there's always this aspect that God is love. Yes, he sent his son to die for us. Yes, he gave his life on Calvary. But God is a holy God. And if we don't accept his way of escape, his salvation, his mercy and grace, we will face judgments. I think the second way we people mock God today is to think I got plenty of time to repent. I'll party today, I'll have a great time today, and one day I'll get saved, one day I'll turn my life over to him, one day I serve him. You know what the book of James says? He says, your life is like a vapor, it's a puff of smoke, it's here for a short time, and then it vanishes and goes away. Listen, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. In fact, that's why the Bible's emphatic today. Today is the day of salvation. If you've been messing around with God and playing with God and thinking that I can accept God on my own terms and my own time, you are mistaken. There is gonna come a day when God's spirit will not always strive with mankind. And if you say no to the voice of the Holy Spirit again and again and again, there will come that time when you won't be able to hear the voice of God. And so if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart this morning, repent, get right with God, get saved today. Today is the day of God's salvation. Don't mock God and think you got tomorrow. You don't necessarily have that. We are not guaranteed that. It matters what you sow. It matters what you sow. If, if, if I sow into the soil wheat, what am I gonna reap? Five people got it. Let's try it again. If I sow wheat into the ground, what am I gonna reap? Wheat, right? We, we, we got it. We get that in the natural order. All of human life is sowing. We are either sowing to the flesh or we are sowing to the spirit nature. Uh, We sow every time we think, we sow every time we speak, we sow every time we act. We are sowing seeds that form our character and the character ultimately determines our destiny. And so he says, sow to the spirit and not the flesh. So I wanna ask you, how do we do this? What kind of seeds do we sow and how do we know that at the end we win? Well, first of all, number one, if you're taking notes, jot this down and you can follow along on your YouVersion app or the Faith Is Here app somewhere and I think you can go to the link and, and the notes are all there. First of all, realize we're in a battle. We are in a battle today. I wanna go back to chapter five and I wanna look at the last part of that chapter as well this morning. It says in verse number 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So they are in conflict with each other so that you cannot do whatever you want. Now there's this this constant battle that Paul says is going inside of every single one of us. It's with our flesh. It's this battle with our flesh and the flesh is simply that old, stinking, selfish nature that every one of us got from Adam. We got that flesh, stinky Adam nature. And and the flesh does not wanna submit to God. It it resists God, it resists the will of God. It does not wanna submit to God. Now now, let me just share something with you right now and I wanna be totally honest, and I try to be all the time, but I I want you to get this. I think what happens is a lot easier to blame our sins and our problems and our situation on the devil and demons than my own stinking flesh. My flesh, this flesh, Larry flesh, is rotten to the core. But if I can blame the devil or I can blame a demon or something else from the outside on that, then that kind of absolves me from all responsibility whatsoever. I wanna tell you what gets you in trouble, what gets your mouth in trouble and your thought process in trouble and all these other things is our own stinking flesh. It's not the devil, it's not demons, it's not anything else. It, it, it's easier to blame someone else. I, I don't, I'm dating myself, some of you older ones will remember this. There was Flip Wilson, and he used to be on uh, the Carol Burnett show and some of these comedy shows, and he would dress up like Geraldine, and he would say, the devil made me do it. I remember that. And, and so, yeah, some of you guys are as old as I am around here. Uh, the devil made me do it. And it's, it's just easier to blame the devil for everything that happens in our life. But that's not what God's word says. Let me give you what God's word says. James 4 and verse 1. What causes fight and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Doesn't come from this battle inside of you. It, it's not from any outside force. That's where your anger and your bitterness and Rage all comes from. James 1, 14 and 15. Each person when he is tempted, they are dragged away by their own 
their own evil desires and entice. Then after desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There it is, the law of sowing and reaping, right there in James 1, verses 14 and 15. Let me just add this. A believer, a child of God, cannot be demon-possessed. Cannot happen. I, I just I just said we give far too much credit to Satan and the devil and everything else, but but he's not can be he cannot be demon possessed. You say, where do you get that from? Well, let me give you it from G, Jesus' own mouth. They accuse Jesus Christ of casting out demons by the power of a devil, right? And and the miracles he did and the signs and wonders he did, they didn't want to admit the Pharisees and Sadducees that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. They didn't want to admit that at all, but they had to give some kind of reason for his divine authority and divine power. And they said he must be demon-possessed. He's doing that under the power of the demonic activity. And Jesus looks back at them and he says, you know what, it doesn't make any sense. A house divided against itself cannot stand. It will crumble and fall. That by its very nature is an impossibility. Now here's the deal, when I give my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ lives inside of me. So if he is inside of me, I cannot be divided between Christ and devils and demons. And so, <coughs> excuse me, a believer cannot be demon possessed. That's liberating. I'm free in Christ. I'm surrounded by Christ. I'm protected by Christ. I, there's no de- I don't have to worry about a devil coming and landing inside of me and controlling my life. He will tempt. He will try to deceive. But I am led away, the Bible says, by my own flesh. Paul says in verse 17, because there's this war that goes on inside of me between the flesh and the spirit, he goes on to say, then we're not free to do whatever you want because if you begin to do whatever you want, you will sow to whatever you're sowing to. And if you're doing whatever you want, you're gonna sow to the flesh. And in chapter six, he says, you will wind up reaping the consequences of your actions. Culture will say today, there's no right or wrong. It's a subjective view of truth. And so what happens is I say what is right for me is not right for you, not right is right right for somebody else. And if you believe this is right, it's okay. It's just not right with me. And so what happens is we just kind of have this subjective view of truth. The problem is that view in culture has slowly crept into the church. So the church has now become tolerant of any view of lifestyle And so the church does not stand up boldly and say this such thing as this is right and this is wrong, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the word of God. And so the church has retreated in silence. Many in the church have retreated in silence lest we offend or are not politically correct. And so we hide under this guise of political correctness and we say nothing and we get quiet lest we be an offense. The problem is when we become the basis for our own truth, my own truth, there's no solid foundation to build my life upon or our lives upon or my belief system upon because there is no absolute truth. The only foundation for the believer can be the unchangeable word of God. It's the word of God is my plumb line and it's by that I measure everything else in my life. One of the darkest time periods in Israel's history was the period of the judges. And uh, there, there's this verse that kind of typifies the judges. And it says in Judges 17, 6, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now listen to me. In the absence of King Jesus, we become our own kings and our own rulers and our own gods. And so the absence of the king leads to every man doing what is right in his own eyes. As believers, I don't have my own truth. The only truth I have is God's truth. It is his word. The word of man passes away. Every word out of the mouth of man will pass away, but God's word will never, ever pass away. It is unchangeable. It is unfallible. It is my rule for life. It is the rule for everything I do. It must be based on the word of God. And that truth then becomes my foundation upon which I build my life. And the Bible said if we build our foundation on obedience to the word of God, it's like building our lives upon the rock Christ Jesus. And as a result, when the rains and the storm come, 
comes, it will never ever crumble. But if I want to build it on my own truth and what is right in my own eyes, when the storms come, my life is destroyed because there's no anchor, there's no rock, there's no hope. I build it upon Christ Jesus. That's the good news. Listen to John 14, 16, and 17 in the New Living Translation. It says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And so that Holy Spirit within me reveals the truth of God through the word of God. Mm, mm, mm. There are battles that we are facing right now in our lives that only God can handle. And there are strongholds in our lives that only the Holy Spirit can break through. There is a battle that is going on, the Bible says, the two war against each other. The flesh wars against the spirit and vice versa. But God allows the battles to happen so that we might grow. It's through the battle that we grow. It's through the battle that we get strong. In fact, he left the enemies in Israel, when Israel crossed into the promised land and they won a few early victories, it says he left the rest of the enemies so that Israel might learn how to fight. And so the battles are an important part of our life and our spiritual growth and development. The battle humbles me realizing that there's a battle going on and I am frail in my own self and my own strength. The battle makes me watchful. And he says, watch and pray lest you fall in temptation because there is a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. My eyes are always open. The battle forces me to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ because I realize how utterly helpless I am without him. And I turn to him and I cry out to him and I seek his face. The battle makes me aware of the magnitude of God's grace, that God is so gracious and so kind and loving and forgiven that the battle causes us to long for heaven all the more because in heaven there'll be no more warfare or battles or fighting with this flesh nature. It will forever be taken care of and so shall we be with the Lord and we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. The stress and strain of war is but for a brief time but in the end, the Bible says every enemy will be conquered and the final enemy, death, will be vanquished forever. There's a battle. There's a battle. We need to know that and understand that. And yet there's some benefits that come out of this battle. The second thing I want to share is that you must be rooted in Christ. If you're going to have the right kind of fruit, we've got to be rooted in Christ Jesus. And I want to read to you now Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. And it says there, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now let me just share a profound, uh, agriculturally sound principle. To have healthy fruit, you must have strong roots. To have healthy fruit, you gotta have strong roots. It, it, in, in fact, it, uh, you can take good apples, you can place them on a dead tree, and you can come back and graft them in or attach them to the tree any way you want to try to, but the fruit will rot. The fruit can't make the tree alive. But a living apple tree with good roots will what? Produce luscious, wonderful fruit. Amazing apples. Now, now let me just talk to you a minute about the roots. You can't see the roots. They're under the ground, but you see the fruit. If you wanna have something that will be appealing to this world, luscious fruit to this world and to the body of Christ, if you wanna exemplify that in your life, you've gotta take care of what is unseen and nurture that and get your roots deep in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't work and say, oh, I just want, need more love, I need more peace, I just need more this, and we strain and struggle. The fruit won't come, but if I focus on Christ and I anchor in him, the fruit becomes the natural byproduct of a life connected to Jesus, right? So I connect to Christ, my root system is strong. In fact, a root system of a tree can be anywhere from four times to seven times the size of the crown of the tree as it spreads out underground. But, but the roots are not seen. It is rooted in Christ privately. Listen to me. There is no substitute for spending time alone in the presence of Jesus. No substitute for that. It is so, so vitally important. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he had his places where he would get alone to pray and seek his Father. Now, he's in constant communication with his Heavenly Father all the time, but there were times he would just separate himself from the disciples, from the crowds, from everybody else to get alone. The Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he goes there in his last hour before his crucifixion, but I will tell you this, he was in the habit of going there. That had become for him a place of prayer, and they knew exactly where they could find him. Around the shores of Galilee, there's mountains and hills all around Galilee, and the Bible said Jesus would often go up into the mountains to be by himself, and before he chose the disciples, he went up to the mountain, and he sought God, and God downloaded, these are the guys I need you to add to your kingdom. I, they, when he would go up to the mountain, he'd watch his disciples get in a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. The storm would come up and he said you know what I better stop praying and get down there they're going to drown and so he would go down and walk out to where they're at and he joins them on the sea of Galilee and would say peace be still what's he doing he is getting alone by himself with his heavenly father and I will tell you if the son of almighty God had to do that every one of us need to find that alone time with the Lord in prayer and seeking God and spending time with him and as we do that our roots are getting stronger and stronger and it says in Psalm 1 we'll be like that tree that's planted by the streams of living water whose roots go deep into the ground and when the dry seasons come I'm tapped into Jesus Christ and it will even in the dry times the tree will flourish because the roots go deep the roots you got to deal with what is unseen the Holy Spirit does not work in our life in terms of a vacuum. He always uses things like the word of prayer to mature us, the prayer time, the word of God, our worship time with the Lord, fellowship with one another in the body of Christ, to what? Build up our spiritual man, to sow to the spirit, and then in Christ we produce the fruit of the spirit. John 15, five, I am the vine, and you're the branches. If you remain in me, and I and you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The third observation that I wanna make about having this kind of sowing to the spirit and spirit nature that will be victorious and reap everlasting life is, is simply that fruit grows over time. It's not instantaneous. Look, if you would, at verse 24 and 25 of chapter five. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh have crucified, past tense, with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. A tree that is healthy is one that is growing. If a tree is not growing, it's not healthy. William Burroughs had this to say, when you stop growing, you start dying. Now, now he says in verse 24, you belong to Christ. Since we belong to Christ, I identify with what Christ has done. I identify with him as a child of God. And as I identify with Christ, I will be growing in the fruit of the Spirit in my life. So I identify what? With his, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. He just says in Romans chapter six, we have been buried with Christ. And he says in chapter six as well, we are raised to walk with him in what? Newness of life. So I identify with all that Christ has done in my life because I am one with him and he is one with me. I identify in his crucifixion. And so the old man, the Bible says, Paul says, that old nature was crucified with Christ Jesus. He said, I have been crucified. Now, now, what happens? How can we keep messing up? We live beneath our privileges as children of God, and we don't realize what God has provided for and done in our life. And so Paul tells the Romans in Romans 6, therefore reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. And so I live out of the fact now in my life that, hey, that old man's dead. I don't have to go and sin anymore. I don't have to do what I used to do. I don't have to live the same kind of lifestyle. I don't have to think, think the same thoughts I thought before. Why? Because I've been crucified with Christ. The old man is dead. It was nailed with Christ to Calvary. And now I'm what? Living with him in newness of life. Paul says, it's no longer I that live. I'm not living anymore. That guy's dead. But now it is Christ that liveth in me. I live out of the resurrection life, okay? You, you, you got that theologically. 
And yet many believe, live beneath their privileges as children of God. I don't have to obey that old sinful nature anymore. Now, why do we struggle so much? I have to set my eyes and my heart on Jesus Christ, my new king. So I'm not looking at trying to overcome all these things that I used to do in my own strength. I fix my eyes and heart on him. I get tapped into the root. It is never just saying no to sin, although he says we are not free to do whatever we want. It's not just saying no to sin. It's more about saying yes to the Holy Spirit within me. Right? Every choice you make, you're going to either make a choice to feed the old nature, the man who was crucified, or the new nature, the spirit of God with inside of me. And so, so if I'm gonna make a choice to feed my spiritual man, he calls that sowing to the spirit. But I cannot do this on my own. You can't do it by yourself. Uh, turn to Romans chapter seven. I think this is where a lot of people find themselves in their life. Romans seven and verse 15 and they find the same struggle that Paul experienced. He says, I do not understand what I do, for what I wanna do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Anybody have that struggle? I have. Man, I get up, I'm gonna pray today, God, I'm gonna get really close to you, and a whole day goes by, I get a phone call, I get this happen, something pops in my office, something goes on, and boy, I missed a day. Every intention of praying. I'm, I'm the only guy that happened to, happens to once in a while. But what I hate, I do what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. It's that, it's that old nature. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I do. This I keep on doing. So, so, so it's this idea that somehow I can just say no to sin and I won't deal with that problem anymore. It's, it's, it's less about saying no to sin. It's more about saying yes to the spirit of Christ and keeping our eyes and our heart fixed on him. And then he helps us in our growth and development spiritually. We can get so determined to do what is right in our own strength, we will fail. And this is the struggle of keeping the law. We can't do it. Um, there was a story about a young man. He's a bright guy, and, uh, but he was socially awkward. How many men can relate to socially awkward men and, and around women especially? We're socially awkward, and so I was kind of like that, and, and he, he just couldn't, couldn't fight, find and meet the right kind of girl. And so his buddy tells him, hey, let, let me give you some pointers here. He says, I want you to stick out your chest and have confidence. I want you to walk up to that good looking girl and, and, and I want you to just ask her this simple question to just kind of open things up. What are you looking for in a man? And then you be that person. And so he says, okay. So uh, he sees a beautiful girl. He's gonna start this, he's gonna try it. He musters up all his courage, sticks out his chest, walks up to her and say, hey baby, <laughs> what are you looking for in a man? And the girl looked back and thought for just a moment and says, well, Possibly someone like the American Indians. They had these strong jaws. They were so rugged and strong, brave and so, so strong. And, you know, you know or, or maybe somebody like, like a Jewish man who is just very smart with money. Of course, she uses every stereotype there is. Every wise with money, very smart, and maybe, maybe a Jewish man. Or, you know, or just maybe a Southern man. Just a just warm hospitality, a gentleman, a southern gentleman, and maybe that cute little southern accent to go along with it. And then she looked back at the guy and said, hey, by the way, what is your name? And, and the man thought for just a second, said, my name is Geronimo Goldstein, but my friends call me Bubba. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get it right, right? <laughs> it, it, it's hard in our own strength and our own might and we can't win the battle between the flesh and the spirit in our own strength. So the solution, listen to me, is not to fight our flesh and focus on our flesh or we become self-conscious, but rather to surrender to the Holy Spirit. When I surrender to the Holy Spirit, I become God-conscious. Am I making sense? 
Because the more I, I, I say, try to say no, 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 I'm focusing on myself, my strength, keeping the law, legalism, whatever you, word you want to use, right? But I become very self-conscious. I'm now looking inward. But the more I focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and who he is and all his goodness, then he begins to change my life and I begin to see those fruit in my life that God desires out of me. It's about changing my focus. It says in Psalm 40 and verse eight, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Wow. Listen to Colossians 3, one and two. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Listen to me, anybody in here afraid of heights? What do they tell you when you're crossing a high bridge and your buddies are trying to get you across that bridge? Don't look down, right? Because you think you're on flat ground, you don't look down, you don't see your 200 feet above the ground, right? Don't look down. And I think the same, that's what Paul says to the Colossians. Don't look down. Set your affection on those things above where Christ is seated. Get your mind and your heart on Christ Jesus and don't look down at the earthly things that we spend all our time fighting the flesh, looking down, doing all this. We find ourselves like the Apostle Paul in this vicious cycle of not doing what I want to do and doing what I don't want to do. And so we get in that dilemma in this battle. And I would tell you the best advice is don't look down. Set your mind on things above, not on things below. And so he says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He didn't say, just say no. He said, what do you do? Walk in the spirit. I keep my eyes and my heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 25, keep in step with the spirit. In the NIV, in the King James, it simply says walk in the spirit. And, it, and this walking idea implies forward progress. It, it's like I'm moving. I'm going somewhere and I'm getting somewhere in my spiritual journey. And the Holy Spirit leads and he guides us. He leads us into all truth. He gives us victory over our flesh. And, and it doesn't mean I'm never gonna slip or fall or stumble or sin. But when I do, that Holy Spirit is with me as my divine counselor and comforter. He, he speaks to my heart and can convicts me of sin and I turn back and repent to the Lord Jesus Christ and he keeps me right along in my spiritual journey of growing in him. We're gonna fail, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna fall. But the Spirit of God is right there with me every step of the way. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you one more key right here and that is it all starts with worship. Worship. The Bible says, and I read it to you in Judges, where there was no king, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And so if I am not in a posture of worship before God every day of my life and recognizing he's my Lord, he's my Savior, he's holy, he's my king, and I fix my eyes off him, I become less self-aware and more God-aware. God-conscious. There's something powerful about worshiping God that takes my focus off myself and my situation and what's going on and puts my focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done. Worship from the heart makes then room for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me as he wants to. Mm. We keep in step with the Spirit, we become more and more like Jesus Christ we become more like Jesus Christ as he transforms us through this process of growth. As I become more like Jesus Christ, all of a sudden that fruit in my life grows, becomes more luscious and more a blessing to the world. Sowing in the spirit means I expend my time, my thoughts, my resources, my efforts and my heart on Christ Jesus and not myself. Sow in the spirit, sow in the spirit. Don't mock God. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You say, practically, how do I do this? How do I sow to the Spirit? And I've given you some keys already, but let me just give you a few more. I would encourage you to sow in the Word of God. When you sow in the Word of God by spending time in His Word and reading and memorizing the Word of God, what happens is you will reap a knowledge of God's Word and God's ways. And, and David said what? The word of God have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. So as you sow in the word, God will help you in your daily life to overcome 
sin or the flesh, right? I wanna encourage you to sow in prayer. What will you reap if you sow in prayer? You'll reap power from God in your life every single day. And, and you'll bring the kingdom of God down on this earth and you'll see Christ manifest himself in the world and in your life in incredible ways. The Bible says what? As you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, what on earth as it is in heaven. If we wanna bring God's rule down into our families, our situations, our workplace, our neighborhoods, what do I do? I need to find that place of prayer and say, God, your kingdom come now. God, come and minister and bring life now. When I sow seeds of the gospel, what am I doing? You'll reap and see the joy of lives transformed around you. You'll see men and women come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll see your family members come to know Jesus Christ because the Bible says what? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And so I'll sow the gospel and we'll reap in salvations and transform lives. So in faithfulness in the church and serving God, what do you see? Growth in your own life. You'll see you're giving yourself away, stability that God can bring through service and ministry. If you'll sow in generosity, what you'll reap? You'll reap the blessings of God that he has for you in your life. Not only blessings in financial ways, but blessings in so many other ways in your life. In fact, he will use this scripture, sowing and reaping. Here he uses it to talk about the battle of the flesh in Galatians chapter six, but in 1 Corinthians, he uses it to talk about giving. He says, he who sows generously will what? Reap generously. And so he uses it in terms of our financial giving and our generosity. And then finally, sow to the spirit, the spirit man, the spirit nature. And what he says we're gonna reap, we'll reap more love and more joy and more peace and more long suffering and more gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Now I want to say, Paul never said that would necessarily be easy. Sometimes it's a lot easier to do what everybody else is doing around us. Act like the world and adopt this world's culture. Didn't say the battle would be easy. Our, 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 our natural selfish tendency always has a bent and lean towards the flesh. That's why I need Jesus Christ. That's why I need him to save me and, and keep my eyes and focus upon him. So in verse nine, he has this thought, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. In other words, don't ever, ever give up. Keep on sowing, keep on sowing. And just like with any tree or plant or anything else, sometimes you'll sow that seed. It takes years for that thing to come out. And it may take three or four more years for you being to see fruit on that tree. And at first, at times, you see the fruit's gonna be puny and maybe not edible and not that good. And all, and all you do is just prune it back and keep pruning it back. But eventually, that fruit begins to grow and that tree begins to grow and the roots begin to grow. And, and we get strong and solid in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, don't give up, don't give up. Keep on sowing to that spiritual nature and we will see the fruit in due time, the rewards will come, a fulfilled life, peace with God, spiritual growth, and most of all, the greatest reward is Christ himself. Christ himself. Keep sowing, don't grow weary, don't faint. John chapter 12, Jesus Christ announces his upcoming death. And he makes another agricultural thought here, and it's just all about sowing and reaping, and you see it played out in the life of Christ, and the death of Christ. He says, except a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And what happened is God sowed his only begotten son into this world, who went by way of the cross, who was sown into the ground, so that out of his death, and resurrection, there will be many, many, many seeds come for that. You know, we got seeds all around this place today, seeds because they gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I wanna tell you, if you haven't asked him to come into your heart and life, today's the day of salvation. Don't put it off, don't think you got tomorrow. If you're not right with God, you can invite him to come into your heart and life and he will save you today. It's a matter of saying, God, I need you. I can't save myself. I believe you died and rose again for me. If you say, Lord, please save me, he'll do it in a moment's time. And old things are passed away and everything becomes new. And then you have that, what, assurance of everlasting life. Bow your heads and close your eyes.
Father, I thank you. I thank you for everyone here today. Thank you that you love them so, so very much. All of us, God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you allowed yourself to be sown into the ground for us, that you might see a harvest called your church. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for not only what you're working at in our lives every day as we get our heart and mind set on you as we sow to the Spirit and we, we see that Spirit-filled life and walk, God. I thank you, Jesus, for, for helping us every day to grow in you. But I pray right now for someone in here, a man, a woman, somebody, Lord, who may not know you as Lord and Savior, that today they will surrender their heart to you. I thank you, Jesus.